the paper that I wrote over a year ago for Aria Project. Um, I think I submitted it in December 2007, and it begins by making the following point. The world's biggest mega project subsumes all the others. It is the promotion of mobility. All significant participants in the project are now below the Spanish enterprises. The motor industry measures success by numbers of vehicles sold, judged by this criteria, despite global, global overcapacity prospering. Going still faster the aviation industry. <coughs> Railways, after decades <coughs> in the doldrums, <coughs> are being revitalized by mega high speed projects. The result is an emerging hypermobile society. Oops. All of those trends that I was exclaiming about uh, less than a year ago, just over a year ago, come to a, a guttering halt. Um, but at the end, I, I, I look to see whether I can salvage anything from all this. And this is the final sentence. Hypermobility breeds fatalism, about which I'll say a bit more in a moment. Without egalitarian restraint of present trends, dystopian science fiction appears likely to provide our best guide to the future. Well, the the restraint on present trends has been anything um, but egalitarian, if you have been following the quitting of the, uh, the big bankers <coughs> um, by Parliament um, just today. Um, but the, I'm, I'm just going to look at the, at the principal features of this process <coughs> that I've been calling hypermobility. I, I use the word um, First, for a project that I did for the OECD's Environmentally Sustainable Transport project a few years ago, uh, they had been working with scenarios, and uh, they had uh, they were principally concerned with, uh, in terms of environmental sustainability, they were principally concerned with energy consumption and emissions, and so they had a variety of scenarios. Um, Two contenders were what they called technical fix, tier more efficient engines, and demand restraint. And they invited me to write a report on the social consequences of these scenarios. And I had great difficulty getting started because the two scenarios were pulling in opposite directions. Everything that the technical fixers were proposing was weakening the force of the levers on which the demand restraints were put. So I, I, I broke free by inventing the pollution-free perpetual motion engine. I, I said, let's give the technical fixers all their wildest dreams and then some, and then try to imagine what the world would look like. Um, and uh, in, in trying to um, imagine that world with the social, social characteristics of it, I, I simply chose my few basic trends and. and projected them into the, uh, the future. So first it was bound to be more dispersed, there would be more suburban sprawl as this carbon pressure continued to increase. It would be more polarized, there would be greater disparity between rich and poor because all those who couldn't afford cars were going to get left behind. More anonymous and less convivial, every year fewer people know their neighbors, actually anchor them. Less child friendly, children's freedom would be further curtailed by parental fears. Less culturally distinctive, the culture would be further advanced. The Hilfianization of the world would continue to pace. More dangerous for those not in cars, more mental emotion, long fatter, less fit, less exercise, more familiarity routines, more crime that is written, less social cohesion, more fear of crime, subject to a more Orwellian style of policing. Less trusting, the rise of the audit risk assessment culture, which I'll say more about in a moment, and less democratic, the majority will have less influence over the decisions that govern their lives. In, in the globalized world, uh, nobody works directly for um, the, w, the, the World Trade Organization, the World Bank, the UN, or you. How many people here know, can give me the name of a single 
Euro MP who represents them. Anyone? No. Okay. Well, <clears throat> I've been I've been running that question straw polling classes for for about ten years. Well, I thought you were going to give me the name. No, sorry. <laughs> uh, and in ten years, I've probably put the question to about a thousand students. And in ten years, I've got one student who can name one. So that I use as an indication of, of you know. Uh, more and more of our lives are governed by directors coming up to Brussels, and uh, uh, some of the vote for these people, we can't remember their names, I can't. Um, well, that doesn't seem to me to be democracy as I remember. Uh, well, the, the mega projects are feeding these trends. Um, producing um, more and more mobility, and in the stimulus packages that I've been reading about, um, they are fighting their way to the head of the queue for um, money that will um, employ people in the construction industry and, and uh, save the car industry and all of that. So, um, as I read it at present, the, the, to the extent that the stimulus packages succeed, they will be uh, reflating and enlarging the bubble that is just first. Um, but I'm not going to um, dwell on that. What I, what I want to talk about more are uh, from now on are problems of risk management in this hyper-mobile world. And I'm going to concentrate on the, the last three bullets. It will be more Orwellian less trust in how you manage risk in conditions of low trust, less democratic. Um, and I promised in the, in the little flyer that preceded this um, seminar to uh, uh, talk about paranoia. And I think all of these conditions are conducive to paranoia and managing risk in paranoid world um, is, is rather difficult. Uh, and I want to uh, begin by looking at the, the transformation to overcome the process of risk management. Um, in May 2004, I typed a single word risk into Google. And for purposes of comparison, I typed in God and sex. God got 60 million hits, sex 80 million, and this 40 million. A year and a half later, I did it again. God was up to 188, sex to 21, and risk to 537 million. Now, sadly, you can't play this game with Google anymore because they capped all three. Of us. They felt it was beyond the joke. But I tried it on Yahoo, uh, and, and they appear not to have capped it. And, and risk is now up to 1.8 billion. Um, still ahead of God, but sadly, sex is overtaking it again. <laughs> uh, the, I mean, this is, this is an extraordinarily crude measure, um, but I think it does say something about the, the, the growing obsession with risk and the way in which it is morphing into paranoia. Uh, everywhere I look, I see signs <coughs> of paranoia, literally signs. That's a sign on the BBC studio door. Uh, John Humphreys was unable to tell me how to exercise the caution. Uh, that's Marks and Spencer's. Uh, every time you go on London transport, everywhere you look, you're being told, don't take any risks. Sainsbury's offers, my shopping bag in Sainsbury's offers some useful advice. <laughs> And here is the 
Um, recently sent to me by the, the first um, grandchild of a, uh, a, a friend of mine, and uh, death or serious injury can occur, so he's going to grow up to obviously be very careful. <laughs> now, now I, I think of these, all of these signs as, as juju charms to fend off the no win of a few lawyers, and they're probably about as effective. Um, but they are um, manifestations of paranoia, I would argue. There are other signs that are positive incitements to paranoia. On London transport, um, if you see or hear anything suspicious, not specified, just be suspicious. If that isn't an incitement to carry on, I'm not quite sure what he is. Um, now, here, here it gets a little bit more specific. This is Muswell Hill, the shelter in Muswell Hill. And so we're supposed to be worried about terrorism. And this sort of um, promotion of, of, of uh, suspicion. Um, one of my bullet points earlier uh, referred to the fact that the world is getting increasingly Orwellian. And I think that um, this incitement to the general population is now rebounding on the government who are now coming under attack for the 42 days uh, incarceration without charge and ID cards and all of that is getting uh, coming under attack, and more and more, uh, the government is, is being labeled big brother by people who, who uh, like these trends. Well, just to emphasize the point of how dramatic the changes have been <coughs> over time, um, they appear even more dramatic if we go a little further back in time. Uh, uh, I'm not sure how many of you have been in the Royal Geographical Society, but in the main lecture theatre um, are displayed on a frieze that runs just below the ceiling all around the lecture theatre, the names of the heroes of the heroic age of geography. Well, I got in touch with the archivist and she came back with the information that a quarter of them had died on the job. Uh, it was dangerous work, risky work. Uh, let's fast forward to the geography department at UCL. Oh, sure, that's Captain Cook in um, 1779. Uh, he clearly didn't do his risk assessment. Uh, well, he did. He, they knew what they knew the enterprise they were embarking upon was, was risky, but they they, um, they somehow imagined the rewards and. And power, glory were outweighed the, uh, the risks. The geography department now, CL, we have a 69 page guide to doing risk assessments for field work. Do you have anything similar here in France? <laughs> okay, well, the, um, it, it explains that risk assessment, all activities is required by law. Uh, I complain that just the significant ones, well, how do you know if it's significant or not, unless you've assessed it. So you're supposed to read all 69 pages if you find a risk that you haven't thought of. Well, if you click on the main hazard index there, uh, you get to that menu. If you click on environment, you get to that menu. If you click on terrain, you now get to the meat of conventional risk assessment. You identify the risk and the associated control measure. Risk of slips, trips, and falls. I'm sure you can see your feet before walking. <laughs> risk of personal injury caused by boundary fences. If working close to the fences, so don't turn your back on the fence in case you back into it. So, <laughs> this is. <laughs> uh, now, I, I use, I, I, I use, I've used this a lot, and, and one response um, is, is people will uh, send me their risk assessments from their place of work. And the, the, the one from BP is even, it, it trumps this. Not just on oil platforms and things like that, but in the office, every meeting must begin with the senior, most senior person at the meeting pointing out where the fire exits are. Uh, and then there are other things, other injunctions like uh, uh, you mustn't tilt back in your chair and if you see somebody else doing it, uh, I tell them not to. Uh, if you want to move your coffee from one desk to another, it should have a lid on it. 
so this, um, I, th I think we're, 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 all, we're all world leaders, we're close to it, but we're not exceptional. This, is, this stuff is happening everywhere. And I, again, uh, I, I offer it as, as um, support of my contention that the world is becoming more paradigmatic. But what are we trying to measure, to, to um, manage? Uh, you don't have to read all 1.8 billion Google hits to discover that uh, risk is a word that uh, means different things to different people. You find lots of unnecessary arguments by involving people who are using the same word, meaning different things by it and shouting past each other. Um, so I find this little Venn diagram helps to uh, uh, clear away, clear out of the way, at least some of the unnecessary arguments. Firstly, directly perceptible. Climbing tree, riding bike, riding a car, crossing the road, these are risks that we manage using judgment. We don't undertake a formal probabilistic risk assessment before we cross the road. Um, judgment in the form of instinct, intuition, and experience usually gets us safely to the other side. Uh, here, perceived through science, this is the circle that dominates the, the risk management, risk assessment literature. Uh, color, you need a microscope to see it, scientific training to know what you're looking at. Uh, in this circle, you find the whole range of sciences from uh, people with macros with microscopes to astronomers with telescopes, plotting incoming asteroids, uh, physicists, chemists, biologists, um, and uh, at the softer end, you have actuaries, uh, statisticians, epidemiologists, hedge fund managers. Uh, and this is the circle that tries to quantify risk. I usually use it as the conventional definition of risk as being equal to some measure of the magnitude of consequence of an accident times the, the, the probability of the accident. Um, but then moving on to the third circle, which I take to call virtual risk, the scientists just don't know or cannot agree. Uh, Scientists are arguing with each other in ways that the rest of us can't um, make sense of. Um, ESC infected weakness can do very CJD, global warming, global radiation, pesticide that is used, whether you use HRT or opposed, passive smoking, and now with the vengeance, the stock market. Uh, and increasingly, uh, fear of the no win, no fee lawyer. What is my liability if something goes wrong on my watch? Terrorism uh, increasingly looked at in the form of risk management. Um, if there's time at the end, I'll give you an example. And Harold Wilson's events view boy, <coughs> or Donald Rumsfeld's unknown unknown to things that hit you out of the blue. Well, I was recently um, phoned by somebody making a television program risk and they said they, they, they wanted um, any evidence on ahead of how good people were at managing risk. That was the question. And I said, well, what kind of risk? Well, risk. And I said, well, um, most of us are pretty good at crossing the street. Uh, the, so that category of risk, um, we are all risk managers. Um, in this circle, um, the motor insurance actuary can see patterns that we cannot see with the naked eye. <clears throat> um, but uh, there were a lot of people, uh, it's turning out now, uh, who thought they were going to be very clever in this circle with their clever derivatives, uh, who were actually somewhere around in the overlap or maybe way out here. Um, and so I said, well, we all seem to be pretty good at this. Um, there are some, uh, some, uh, some risks that can be usefully reduced to numbers, meaningfully reduced to numbers. Um, but out here, uh, in, in, in the virtual circle, uh, it turns out that uh, many of these people, with their clever instruments, uh, 
they have a clue. And yet their instruments were so clever that uh, until things started to unravel, they, they had um, convinced the rest of the world that they were um, pretty clever. Uh, so what risk, are you, what risk are you trying to manage? And if you're in this circle, if science cannot settle the issue, then you are thrown back on judgment. Some combination of instinct, intuition, and experience. You would like you you would like to have further numbers, but if you don't have them, you don't have them. Um, and uh, so I would, I would nominate Warren Buffett as a good practitioner in this region. He says, "I don't understand it. I don't buy it." <coughs> and uh, he's he and George Soros are pretty good market psychologists. Um, also in this in, in, in this circle, um, how good am I? How good are any of you perceiving the risk to take? Something you didn't use today or yesterday. Uh, perceive, how good are you perceiving the risks of eating eggs? Well, the headline this morning: Eggs are now good for us. <laughs> Previously, we were we were only supposed to eat three a week maximum, and now we now we can eat any day we want. Uh, new evidence. Uh, well, you know, that's the most recent evidence. Maybe maybe we'll be back to. Uh, worrying about them sometime soon. Um, okay, so it matters you think what sort of risk you're, you're, you're dealing with, how you approach it. Uh, uh, virtual risk was discovered by the New Yorker long before I thought about it. The scientific community has been divided, some say it's uh, dangerous, some say it isn't. Um, okay, how do we manage risk? Uh, this diagram I'm about to this is what I call the risk thermostat. And the thermostat gets set in the top left-hand corner. Everyone has some propensity to take risks, which leads to risk-taking behavior, which leads, by definition, to accidents. Taking a risk is doing something that carries with it a probability of an adverse outcome. And it's through surviving, surviving and learning from them, seeing them on television, being warned by mother, that we acquire our perception of safe or dangerous, and the model postulates that when propensity and perception get out of balance, there's behavior that seeks to restore the balance. Why do we take risks? There are rewards, and the magnitude of the reward influences propensity. So one, one lesson that we can draw from this is that safety measures that don't affect the setting of the thermostat uh, tend to be got round by behavior that reasserts the level of risk which people were originally content with. Um, an example from the, the road is ABS brakes. When ABS brakes first came out, insurance companies offered discounts for cars with ABS brakes. Clearly superior brakes, clearly cars with them were safer cars. Well, the claims insurance accumulated, and they no longer are offered discounts. They weren't having fewer accidents, they were having different accidents. Accidents consistent with high-performance cars, which is what they had become. Um, so this, this is a, <coughs> that is, is seen as enormously frustrating to uh, traditional highway engineers, traditional uh, vehicle engineers. Building all these safety features and then find that people are, are getting around them. Uh, another aspect we can illustrate with this, uh, I call it cost benefit analysis without the pound signs, because both the rewards and accident boxes uh, contain too many incommensurable variables. Uh, money can certainly be one of them. Uh, Economists, uh, some economists, uh, try to argue that they can all be reduced to money in conventional cost benefit analysis. I think they usually are a little bit ridiculous when they try, um, but try they do. Uh, so anyway, money, power, love, glory, food, sex, Russia, the drum, whatever turns you on can uh, help to explain risk-taking behavior. Um, and the converse, 
where highlighted control and loss of control, because they seem to be very important in terms of our perception of risks. Uh, so risk can firstly be risk can be divided between those that are voluntary and those are, that are imposed. Um, a self-controlled voluntary risk in its purest form might be rock climbing. The risk is the reward, the challenge, the adrenaline rush. An applied self-controlled voluntary risk might be driving. Unless you're a young man, you don't do a pretty adrenaline rush, you do it to get to be. Uh, there's me on my bicycle. Um, voluntary, but no control. I may voluntarily get on a plane or a train, and then I hand over control of my fate to the pilot or the train driver. Imposed. Exemplar of the benignly imposed risk is mobile phone masks. Um, now, as I read the literature, there was no risk, uh, but uh, maybe there's a tiny one. Uh, if there is, measured in radiation dose, unless you're up the mask with your ear to the transmitter, the radiation dose that you get down on the ground. Uh, from the handset is orders of magnitude greater than the dose you're getting from the transmitter. And yet, billions of people are queuing up all around the world to take this risk. And almost all of the opposition is focused on the base stations because they are seen as nasty and the positions at the bottom of somebody's garden. Greed or profit motivated. Um, Monsanto is the favorite whipping boy of many environmentalists. They are held to be more interested in the bottom line than they are in the, um, the welfare of the planet or its inhabitants. Malignly imposed risks, rape for murder, and finally, terrorism. Uh, no, no, I'm not going to say anything about this one. So, uh, as you go to up this ranking, risk appears to become more acceptable, and as you head to the bottom, you encounter this phenomenon known as risk amplification, or call it paranoia. And the numbers almost don't matter. The, the number of people killed in the 7th of July bombs, 2005, 52, that represents about six days worth of death on the road. But you don't get 10,000 people in Trafalgar Square every Sunday marking last week death uh, toll three minute silence. Uh, so the, the motivation of the imposer uh, uh, seems to be have a, have a, have a huge effect. Um, another um, problem that we can make another problem for its managers uh, that um, is my attempt to explain what goes on in my, my, my head as I'm trying to catch 134 bus to Muswell Hill, crossing Totten Court Road. I'm late for dinner. I see my bus coming. Uh, if I'm late, for the reward of catching the bus, I take a shorter gas in the traffic. Um, but when risk management becomes institutionalized, you've encountered this phenomenon that I call bottom loop bias. In other words, the, the institutional risk manager often has her, his or her job specified uh, in terms of the importance of reducing accidents, and then still further. And they're frequently enjoined not to have their judgment about what is safe or dangerous compromised by, corrupted by contemplation of the rewards of risk. That's somebody else's department. And I, I, I used this for a workshop that I did for a, uh, a pharmaceutical company, the Health Safety Environment people. They sent me in advance their diagram of risk management. And it was a wiring diagram uh, like this with boxes and arrows and feedback loops, but immensely more complicated. But I uh, took it apart and demonstrated, convinced them that their complicated model reduced in essence, the bottom loop of my model. So I then said, well, who in the company is in charge of the top loop? And 
they scratched their heads and, and one of them said, marketing? Uh, and then I said, and who's in charge of the balancing act? A, a longer pause, uh, and somebody said, CEO? And I said, where is the wiring diagram that has all of that in it and you're still looking for it? Um, um, that's the mantra of the health and safety executive on the website on the letterhead. They are the preeminent risk managers of the country. Um, for the health and safety work, uh, which is now which is expanded to cover more than worse these days, but they are they are overwhelmingly um, suffering from this problem like all lives. There is a converse problem. Uh, uh, called talkative bias. And, and uh, this, I think, is a, a neat and simple way of explaining uh, what has happened with the, uh, the credit crunch. The, the, all of these people currently being interviewed um, by the parliamentary committee right now were, were paying themselves enormous rewards for playing with other people's money. Uh, and if they had an accident in playing with other people's money and, and lost a lot of it, uh, the, they, most of them still had previous year's bonuses in the bank. Um, some, some, they're looking very glum, some of them had it in the company stock, but uh, a lot of them uh, had it in cash in the bank and they still kept it. So uh, their uh, Christmas bonus many years uh, successful years was enough to retire on for life and uh, the worst was likely to happen was they, uh, they had an accident but they had to uh, find a new job. Uh, and we're hearing this term moral hazard frequently and, and that uh, is used a lot by the insurance industry um, and is now being applied to what has been going on with, with credit crunch. <coughs> Insurance companies maintain that um, people who have uh, confidence insurance are less careful about locking up, or if they have smoke alarms, are less careful with fire. But, you know, there is this again this balancing act in response to perceived rewards and risks. Um, we also have to fit our risk thermostat with perceptual filters. Different information about rewards and accidents gets through different people's filters. And the less conclusive science, the more, the, the stronger the effect of these filters. Um, I'll just run through very quickly the cartoon version of a set of perceptual filters, technology bias set. I found very useful. It comes from the work of Michael Thompson. Um, and um, this character down in the lower right hand corner, the egalitarian, you could substitute a perfect mentalist. Uh, he's he's uh, nature is something uh, safer to be obeyed and respected, interfered with as little as possible. Uh, you invoke the precautionary principle at every turn. Uh, if you can't prove it's safe, assume it's dangerous. Much more cheerful chap. Um, this is your venture captain, Mr. Hitch, from the manager of the racing car driver in the mountain here. Uh, they tend to be gamblers because they expect to win more than they lose. They're optimistic, pragmatic. And uh, if you can't prove it's dangerous, assume it's safe. Uh, this sad fellow um, the, the, um, the refugee in the, in the camp or the asylum seeker or the single mom on welfare, these are people who have very little control over the risks that buffet their lives. Um, their risk management strategy usually consists of ducking if they see something about to hit them and buying a lottery ticket. And finally, this is the quadrant where you find most of the risk managers, the regulators. Uh, trying to, trying somehow to, um, uh, well, they're in charge of the system. Uh, they're very nervous in the presence of virtual risk. Um, 
we used this, Mike Thompson and I, for a report he wrote for the Health and Safety Executive called uh, Taking Account of Societal Concerns about Risk from our website. Um, and we, we began by the quote from Margaret Thatcher, there's no such thing as society, <laughs> by which we meant that there's no single monolithic societal view on risk. And we said, you are the statutory hierarchist, you make the rules, enforce the rules. For the foreseeable future, you can expect to be shot at from this corner by the Royal Society for the Prevention of Accidents or the Consumers Association or the Greenpeace Friends of the Earth. You're not good enough to protect us. And from this quadrant, um, my entrepreneurs say you're over regulating and suffocating enterprise. And so I, I, I've tried this out. On, on numerous different audiences, and, and, and find it, it is a character, they are caricatures, but they are also um, people that um, seem to be recognizable. I, I had the enormous <laughs> pleasure of using this um, for a, well, I've done things for the Navy and even done a workshop for MI6, um, and the military. Um, say, oh, we recognize these people. The, the, the military is hierarchical. Uh, and, and so in this corner, they put Eisenhower and the general staff. Um, after a bit of training, they, they put um, Montgomery and Patton and Nelson and Napoleon and the, the adventurers of Drake would be another one. Um, down that corner, the, the average military history. These, these people are ideologically driven, um, very passionate about justice, so down there we have everything from uh, CND and conscientious, conscientious objectives to um, uh, suicide bombers. And up here they put the uh, infantry conscripts. Um, I, used, I used it for um, the conference of um, forensic psychiatrists who do more risk assessments than anybody because they are in charge of who gets kept in and who gets let out and who gets wrong both ways and their uh, reactions to another risk assessment. Um, and, and, and they thought that, well, uh, <coughs> they started prescribing for them. They thought this, this, they thought this guy was, was supposed to be paranoid. Uh, he gets a chlorpromazine. Uh, this guy, they thought, was a bit manic and he, he was given lithium. First, had faith in this Prozac. And then there was a pause, and I said, Well, uh, what's, uh, I said, uh, That's you. You're the governors of Bedlam. Uh, you decide who gets kept in, you said, uh, What's your drug of choice? And they went sideways at each other. One of them finally said, uh, Alcohol. <laughs> uh, so, anyway, just to make the point, oversimplified, yes, uh, but. To, to drive on the point that um, for any particular risk, you can have very different ways of looking at it. Um, this is um, uh, a project. You, you, in, in, in mega projects, you will find uh, frequent use of fault trees and event trees. Any big project uh, likes to reduce the risks to some diagram like this. Uh, this comes from the nuclear industry. Um, Fault tree, backward looking. Um, every every one of these ovals has a probability in it, um, and so these are chains of contingent probability that could have long led to this loss of gas containment. Uh, the 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 event tree is forward looking. What might happen after the loss of gas containment? And again, we have probabilities, chains of probabilities, and um, this is quite a useful way. Setting up systematically what you think you know about a particular risk, it can be useful so long as you don't believe those numbers on the right hand margin of the page. Uh, the problem is that unless you have a large and stable actuarial database for each of these probabilities, there are usually wild guesses with very large error bounds. And the compound error bound by the time you get to the right hand margin of the page is too large to fit on the page. So it's not there. And you end up with uh, single numbers uh, which can be beguiling uh, if you uh, don't think about the error bounds. Um, but nevertheless, a useful metaphor for the way we deal with risk all the time. The real world event tree is much more complicated. 
Um, and we peer through this Dennis Sherman trying to define the probabilities of the right hand margin of the page. Uh, and we think we see a risk worth taking, and then every so often, one that we thought highly unlikely happens. And that's what I've taken to call bad luck. But what happens after you take your bad luck? Hindsight, the fault tree kicks in. Uh, and your left uh, this poor risk manager is increasingly concerned that he will end up in court confronted by a lawyer armed with a forensic machete who hacks away all the other branches and leaves them with a one branch fault tree called culpable negligence. Um, very paranoia inducing. So um, the, the, the foresight risk must be one in ten million, which is the actuarial risk of dying in an encounter with a tree every year. On average, 60 years, people die in accidents with trees. Um, well, there was an accident in, on the National Trust property um, where the boy was killed. Um, the police arrested the park manager and the deputy on suspicion of indigent manslaughter. Uh, and it's, it took the health and safety techniques four years to decide that they weren't going to prosecute him. Um, and uh, Simon Jenkins, who is now the, the chairman of the National Trust, told me that the problem was the National Trust were, were fearful of being prosecuted by a lawyer representing the, the boy's family, prosecuting, fearful of being prosecuted for not prosecuting it. So the risk of one in ten billion uh, the foresight becomes the risk of one in one uh, when you look at it. So what's the poor risk manager to do? Uh, well, the, the first response, which you've seen in the geography department, in PD, and everywhere, forensic psychiatrists, you do risk assessment. You try and assess every conceivable risk. You know, oh, I forgot that one. Whoops, I forgot that one. Oh, I forgot that one. Uh, and then after a while, you realize you can't possibly assess them all. So your fallback position is to make the world or that part of it for which you might be held responsible as foolproof and fail-safe as possible. Um, and, and that is um, one of the drivers of the, uh, the paranoia. And in playground management, it looks like this. That's Castle Haven Community Center in Camden Town, one of the world's safest playgrounds. It's got uh, rubber and matting, barriers. Important safety feature, no twins. <laughs> and even more important safety feature, no children. <laughs> so I asked what was going on, and the answer I got was a stranger hacked away at night because kids might climb the fence and use them on supervised and hurt themselves. So far better that they play out there on the street. If something happens, it's not my fault. And this is what it looks like in the hands of the uh, paranoid. Uh, highway engineer, if in doubt, put in another signal, put in another set of road markings, put in another barrier. Um, and um, this is, is highway engineering based on a particular model of human behavior. All the road users are um, uh, ignorant but obedient autonom automatons. So, they have to be segregated from each other. They have to be given very explicit instructions. Uh, and there have to be sanctions for disobeying those instructions. Uh, well, the uh, increasingly gaining ground now is a, is a converse view of human behavior is informing some uh, brave experiments in, in highway engineering called shared space, where it's assumed that actually the road users are, are <coughs> intelligent, vigilant, considerate even. If you devise, if you convey enough signals that elevate the status of the pedestrian relative motorists, you can mix them um, safely and, and, uh, and produce much more attractive uh, urban environments. Well, I'm not going to have time to go into that, but I'll just give you one example of, of the um, 
of that sort of behavior in accident in, 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 in action that comes from a market in Bangkok. <laughs> so there's transport planning. <laughs> I don't know who did the risk assessment and I don't have any accident statistics, but it is based on the assumption that people are uh, you know, dealing with directly perceptible risks uh, and presumably coping reasonably well uh, you know, by virtue of the fact that it still does like to exist. Uh, but it, it, it um, and I'm going to skip the next couple of slides uh, the, to make the point that um, uh, attitudes to risk vary enormously over time and place. So this is shipbreaking in Bangladesh, armies of people in flip flops. Settling, tor settling torches, uh, carving things up, selling off the pits. Um, here is uh, not BP, but um, the safety regime that's a competitor to that in BP. Uh, I did, I did see a conference for British gas. This is one of their LNG plants uh, in, in Egypt. Um, and they've got uh, helmets, goggles, gloves, fluorescent jackets safety harness, safety boots, um, and uh, that's, that's, the, that's the safety bubble that exists um, in a country that outside defense has safety standards for those in, in uh, Bangladesh. And uh, varies over time, but health and safety executive standards in 1932 in New York and my last slide, an invitation to people to send me evidence. Paranoid anti-terrorism plan. <clears throat> uh, if you try to park your bicycle anywhere near Parliament Square, Whitehall, uh, part of Trafalgar Square, uh, apparently around the Elder Hall, at some times, depending on who's there, the police will nick it on the grounds that it could be a pipe bomb. Um, and uh, this has irritated me for many years. And uh, last June, I started seriously trying to find evidence about the probability of that being the case. And so I put an appeal on my website for evidence uh, of has anyone got an example of anyone anywhere ever being killed by a bunch of this guy in a pipe bomb? Uh, and. Uh, there were lots of people who wrote in saying, well, uh, what's called a pipe bomb frequently is a bicycle used to deliver a bomb. Uh, but the police were confiscating naked bicycles on the ground that it could be a pipe bomb in disguise. Um, and so that got picked up by very cycling grapevines, and that got me on to the Today program to appeal for evidence. That got me on to the World Service to appeal for evidence. And so far, I cannot find a single example of anyone anywhere ever uh, being killed by bicycle, by pet bomb disguised as a bicycle. But there is a punk rock, rock group in Pensacola called This Bike is a Pipe Bomb. <laughs> and they distribute, they, they distribute stickers. And, and there is one on a bicycle in, in um, Ohio University, please notice. They cordoned off the campus. Uh, they, uh, the, the owner came forward and explained that this is a pop group, <laughs> and the police uh, still destroyed his bicycle. 
<laughs> so the, uh, the, another example is paranoia. Uh, that, uh, thus far, the actuarial evidence is that, well, they're there. There's a group. Total fatality is caused by credit bombs and stress by the world, worldwide equals zero. The actuarial risk is equivalent to playing conquerors without problems. End. Thank you very much for the live session. academic thinking and testing, evidence-based research. So by the way the school of confirmation uh, thinks, the evidence actually has to be stacked up before you go to the Orwellian. Uh, the, the predictions you make right, uh, are by certain ways of thinking discredited by virtue of these speculative futures that haven't happened yet. Um, there's no, this is not evidence-based propositions, and so we need to potentially dismiss them perhaps until the evidence arises. And actually, you conclude on saying things, I'd like to know where you are vis-a-vis evidence-based sort of assertions and speculative thinking that reflects developments that haven't quite matured or taken place to their final outcome. But have I made myself sure. clear? So I, I, it's interesting you conclude, you start on one end and you conclude on the other. And I, I'm struggling with this. I mean, well, well, I mean, risk, I get involved in arguing with people who distinguish what they call actual, real, objective risk, which is what the experts know about, yeah. and perceived risk, which was what all the rest of this currently work on. I argue that all risk is perceived. It's a word that refers to the future, and the future exists only in our imaginations. Uh, so the if a if a motor insurance actuary uh, wants to use his numbers to claim that they are objective risks, then I will while they're arguing with them, but nevertheless using them to project next year's premiums still requires him to make an assumption about next year being different from last year, or the same as last year. Um, so even there, and that's the that's the the, the area that has the best data by far. Um, even there you, you have to make assumptions. Uh, and, and so, the, the, rather than using mechani projecting mechanistically, I, I, I like using scenarios, you know, trying to imagine if, if these trends run on, or if these trends deviate in, 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 in certain specified ways, what will things look like? So, beginning with my, um, my hypermobility list, uh, that I thought was pretty easy because you know, you, you had all of these trends running strong, like, like sprawl and, and uh, polarization, and fewer people every year knowing their neighbors. You know, these, these are things that have been pretty well documented and um, seem to me to relate pretty closely to this um, increasing level of mobility and this polarizing level of because the average number of miles traveled by the Britain in 19, uh, 1950 was about 5 miles a day. Now it's over 30 miles a day. Um, forecast, the forecasts are pretty much stuck as we speak. Forecast to be 60 miles a day by 2025. Um, and and um, 
in my in my paper, I, I relate them to all these social consequences. And I think the evidence is confirmed. And, and so, if planning is based on forecasts that assume these trends have to be accommodated, then uh, I think that there will be more scroll, there will be all of these, all of these other, other things that will flow from that. Um, paranoia being one of that. <coughs> other questions? Can I... Uh, it struck me at one point, what you, in fact, what you just said again, John, almost invites creativity into the mix of actually understanding and managing. Which, of course, going back to your my impression of transport, thinking of those delightful rotating people with whom I have off work, as you have, but uh, it's very much. Well, one had the forecasting many years ago when that you phrase another term of the pattern was used on the basis that they're entirely mechanistic. We moved slightly away from it. I mean, are you arguing that in fact a creative element needs to be, has to be brought into the way that you can involve in those professionally involved or dealing with this? Oh, I think I am. The, the, uh, the, the, uh... What I, what I tried to do in my OECD paper was to um, uh, concoct a, a, a pretty unpleasant future society if these, trend, if these trends ran on uh, by way of creating an argument for resisting those trends. The dystopian vision that you outline looks rather like the kinds of visions that are laid out by those actors that want to encourage a more security-oriented way of thinking you know, to justify. I mean, the flip side of risk is security, right? So yeah. forestall those risks. But you're advancing that as a way of critiquing the risk, the institutional risk and management mindset. Well, so I just the question really is. Um, you've given us a very good analysis of institutional risk management, bureau the bureaucratic and the legal approach, the actuarial approach to risk. What does the maybe more political approach to risk, which maybe focuses on accountability, what, what does that actually look like? Where, where do we see that in operation? Where there is a feedback loop that joins the different parts of the diagram, either within institutions or politically? In the fields of foreign policy making, for example, as well as in the city, huge, seemingly crazy decisions have been taken because not because people didn't know what they were doing, but because they didn't have any real accountability or checks and balances, and they were able to get away with them. Well, you put your finger on what, to me, is 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 perhaps the most discouraging, likely consequence of these trends running on. Uh, in the hyper, the hypermobile world is a high-speed, anonymous, low-trust world. People don't know their neighbors, uh, then they, they, they react to them differently. I know you, if you ask me to lend you 10 pounds that night, <laughs> somebody out there in the street, I wouldn't. <laughs> uh, so, uh, one of the, in terms of policing, how do you, in a small village that everybody knows everybody, the policing problems are very, very different from those in the West End where everybody's a stranger. Um, and how do you police the world of strangers? And ultimately, it seems, what I fear is that you either have Orwellian policing with CCTV and DNA databases and all of that, or no effective policing at all. Uh, the, if, if you get all of these strangers distrusting everybody, um, and you, uh, it, it also goes with the democratic point that <clears throat> uh, 
um, as, as we become more and more mobile, we cross traditional authority boundaries more and more and more daily around. Um, and the scale of problems that need governing uh, increases. And if government, the scale of government doesn't increase to go with them, then government simply becomes impotent. So you have this migration of, of political power, authority, responsibility, accountability from the proud Victorian town halls to White Halls to Brussels and ultimately to uh, completely unaccountable organizations like the WTO and the World Bank. Um, and so the, there are growing numbers of, of issues which it can be possibly argued need to be governed at the European scale. Um, and, and policing issues that need to be governed. So we, we're in the process now of, of uh, police forces in North America and Europe agreeing to collect and, and share all of this information about you know, from our mobile phones and our emails and, and all of our travel information and all of that. Um, and and they, they justify it on the, on the basis that um, potential villains are getting more mobile and, and disappear over the border. Uh, we have no effective means of policing. That's what I was referring to earlier on. Traditional academics, traditional research would argue, uh, hang on, John. Where is the evidence base for this? I mean, I've actually been engaged in this dialogue, and I've had referees re report about Palace, if you may remember all Palace's work about WTO. And, and, and our, our profession of academia is very much sort of saying, well, this is speculation. You provide me with the evidence, statistical evidence, or your accusation, and you go and try and find from these very sources the, the statistical evidence. The, the, the Sorry, there's a statistical evidence. The yeah. statistical evidence for police well, forces well, more the, 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 the evidence, collect this information. The, the evidence that the WTO, for example, or the EU, I mean, I, I, I actually very much agree and forward with the same arguments. But what I'm trying to suggest is that the way knowledge building has been groomed in academia, you actually have to provide the evidence to support that accusation before it is legitimized in certain publications and therefore accepted. I'm only pointing out um, a, a problem that we will, in certain courses of academia, only look at the evidence-based outputs rather than the accusation ones, which are patterns that are emerging and have quite yet emerged in a concentrated format that others would accept. You, 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 well, well I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the, uh, I don't know who you argue with. I, you know, <laughs> I, I, I'm giving you the flavor of the sorts of arguments I use. Uh, and, and, uh, and I'm asking you, I suppose, indirectly, how do we as academics respond to these accusations which have yet had the evidence to substantiate? Well, the future hasn't happened yet. We're, I, I, we're, 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 we're trying to, we're, we're speculating about what it might look like. Yes. Um, and um, I find it tremendously liberating and emboldening that all of these rocket scientist risk managers have got it so wrong. If they've caught it up on such a fantastic scale, why am I not entitled to my opinion? Right. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Yes. Um, just a question on the what now kind of uh, thing. Um, my understanding from what you're saying is that uh, a lot of this approach to risk comes from a, a belief that we can actually control the world around us in one way or another. Um, for example, policing. Uh, and would you have a third option in that? Uh, to your either hyper control uh, police or no policing, an option that accepts that we can influence the way we live our lives or we can control it. I.e., we can police a community and find positive ways to do it, but accept that there's an element of uncontrollability there. And we might be this one. Yeah, well, the, um, in, in various things I've written in the past, I, 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 I project 
I, I have a graph of, of recent trends in, in mobility, uh, and I project it back into the past and arrive at the pedestrian peasant village. Uh, and I wouldn't want to live there. It would be socially claustrophobic and, and probably disease ridden and all of that. Um, and then I project it forward until the graph goes off the top of the page. Um, and uh, in that society, I speculate it would look like my bullet points were fresh on. Uh, and so somewhere between, um, it must be some messy area, it'll be fine, uh, that, that uh, would be a more attractive place to live than either. But I cannot see how, if you have this world of um, Well, as you say, free-flowing world. You, 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 what, you, what you have at the present time is, is a huge polarization in terms of uh, who is permitted to travel. Most of, people, most of us in this room uh, can get visas to go just about anywhere we want in the world. Uh, if you're coming from Darfur, you're stuck. You can't go anywhere. Uh, and, and so the to the extent that more and more of these alienated, dissatisfied people um, with understandable grievances are free to cross traditional policing authority boundaries, uh, then it's going to make everybody pretty nervous, I think. So I, I, I think part of the, you know, Part of the solution must be getting back to a more human scale of living, where more and more of us know more of our neighbors better. Because the, the, at a certain level of mobility, policing is, uh, villages are self-policing. Uh, children, children used to, misbehaving children used to be disciplined by neighbors. Uh, now, now everybody's afraid to. Sorry. So, I mean, you've got this spectrum of you know, very, what you call, primitive type village, which you don't want to be claustrophobic. You seem now to be kind of thinking that maybe you're swinging towards that direction because the kind of society you're talking about is one where everybody knows everybody else. So, you're, you're going to have this problem then of social control within the community and limitations of what people can do because those kind of societies will have their own assumptions and their own controls. You know, I mean, go back in Europe and people were actually trying to get out of those kind of societies, going to towns in order to escape their local community because it was too restrictive. So, I mean, are you beginning to become a little bit too sentimental about that kind of community and maybe not critical enough? I mean, I'm, I'm, I might be unhappy about the high mobility, but as you pointed out, there is a problem with the other extreme. And so even if we're talking about say, okay, we're going to try and get back to people knowing each other and all that kind of thing, it would seem very difficult to see actually how that's going to happen. Because these things are being driven by a lot of other forces other than just people not wanting to talk to each other. I mean, talking about the fact that economically they're being forced to move around and to get jobs. So those forces are not going to die away. In fact, they may even increase now because you know, jobs are going to be scarce and so people are Travel farther as a time for children, Susan, etc. So, what really is there in this society that's going to counteract and create this more human, human society at the same time retain the kind of elements of individual freedom? How are you going to? I don't know. It's a question. In, 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 in detail, I'm not sure. I, I'm against extremism. I wouldn't want to live in a peasant pedestrian village, and I wouldn't. I, I, I got, I, I first started really thinking about this, some years ago I, I got invited to speak at a conference of science fiction writers. Um, I thought it would be really exciting that they were the most nerdy lot I've ever met. <laughs> but, but anyway, I, I, I threw out a, um, a challenge. I said, I have not encountered uh, anything in science fiction. Uh, in which distance has been conquered by science and technology, uh, which ran as anything which was run democratically, uh, everywhere from 1984 to the Brave New World, Star Wars, 
form of governance needed to be tyrannical hierarchy, the scale of problems that needed governing um, uh, overwhelmed the democracy which we might know it. Uh, and um, so that was the challenge that none of the nerds, <laughs> none of them came up with a, uh, uh, well, I think I, I think I insisted that the seminary had to be realistic as well. <laughs> Uh, but uh, they, they, didn't, they didn't come up with any um, realistic democracy uh, in the hyperbolic universe. Um, but what sort of forces do you see might counteract the tendency to show? Um, moving around less, I guess. But why? Because if people are under pressure to move more, there has to be some sort of countervailing pressure to slow the thing down. Uh, I can't really see what there is that slows this down. Um, I find it the I've been banging this drum for quite some time, and the only thing that's uh, seemed to stand a chance of slowing it down down is the credit crunch. <laughs> but the credit crunch would have the opposite effect of making people go further and want to find work. They've got to travel around and uh, the, do more. Well, not if unemployment's rising everywhere and everywhere in the world. So your your solution is do. You've got to have a fraction of the two. I, 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 you may have lips, I'm rather pessimistic. Is it, um, I mean, do, do you think changing people's relationships with their cars is, is a, uh, you know, could be part of the solution? Maybe not just the amount of the travel that people do, but how they travel. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, um, I think so. I th I, I, if you track over time the, the increasing levels of car ownership, uh, in, the early, in, in the early days of, of motorization, uh, the, everybody aspired to have one. We're seeing it now in China. Uh, and, and, and governments everywhere uh, adopted programs that assumed that ultimately everyone could have one. Uh, and then you um, look at what might be the, the, the end of this period of growth and you discover that um, there are significant numbers, maybe a whole, maybe a third of the population that will forever be too young, too old, too short-sighted, too nervous, too drunk, too disqualified to qualify for a license. And they are then stranded, they become second-class citizens. Um, dependent for their mobility on either the withered remains of public transport or the goodwill of car owners. And meanwhile, the world has run away from them to the suburbs, the local post office is shut, uh, and, and, and all of that. So that is um, that's the recipe for, for social polarization, which I think can be laid fairly at the door of car dominated transport planning. Can I sort of pick one up which I was going to ask, and I suspect actually might slightly follow that, but maybe not. And this is, um, in a sense, uh, this may come out, this may be now coming out long ago, and so it's been close to my interest for many years. And that is cultural differences between countries. Because I think at the end of the day, discussing around the table what is the British situation, yes, it's happening in the world, but there may be different stages in that, I don't know. One mark that's in my mind is, um, is the UNICEF report two years ago on the quality of childhood life, where we came actually at the bottom and say the Netherlands came right back to the top. Um, is it coincidence or not? The Netherlands is one country, yes, there's far too many of them around their cars and made highways of the ranch shack, but they are still much more <coughs> compact bicycles walking, people don't know step it out to do. Um, I'm not making a particular case, I'm just saying, do you see cultural divides and do these in any way sort of fall into areas you might see worth exploring? I think that's a good question. I think immensely worth exploring. The, the, um, I was invited to give a lecture a couple of years ago in Amsterdam comparing English and Dutch attitudes to risk. Um, and I began by 
saying I've, uh, oh, I began by complimenting my hosts on having a vastly superior cycling safety record to England. And then I said, I've been in Amsterdam for two days and I've seen thousands and thousands of bicycles and only half a dozen helmets. And yet you have a vastly better cycling record. And some guy put up his hand and he said, you were standing in the wrong place. And I was a little bit puzzled. He said, tomorrow morning I will take you and I will stand you on the corner and I will show you this disciplined file of young children, all on bicycles, all wearing day glow jackets, all wearing helmets, and they are cycling to the British school. <laughs> <laughs> and so, the, the, I, I'm sure the, the, uh, the influence of the bicycle is enormously healthy physically and socially, and helps to explain uh, there, there's the guy who some, sometimes we, we blog each other, I can't remember his name right now, who's an Englishman who's gone to live in the Netherlands, and he is, he is an evangelist. He's, he, was, uh, he, he talked about his, his, uh, his daughter who was graduating from primary school to secondary school, and to celebrate the whole class went on a, a um, I think it was an overnight camping trip on their bicycles over a hundred miles. They cycled over a hundred miles. Can you imagine that happening in this country? John, can I ask a question that I wanted to pose as a conclusion to the discussion that we've got? But it actually leads on quite conveniently from Regis. It's the relationship between the activity of a project and the context that actually relates to the previous discussion. It, in that, I think you would agree that risks are reflective of the context and the values held in the context. And whether it's culture or whether it's bureaucracy, it, In the case of mega projects, mega transport projects, what we're particularly interested in, um, is it the case by virtue, to, to, to issues really, by virtue of how complex these projects typically are and how big they are, is it de facto as a result arithmetically means that there's bigger risks associated with it? Is the complexity of size just going to de facto going to make the project? And if it's in Nigeria, where the institutional, cultural uh, framework of delivering, managing, operating, it, it, is it straightforward arithmetic calculation that the risks are even higher? But this relationship between the activity and the project and its environment is, is something that we're, we're, we're having some problems with in our work, particularly see, What's happened now with the credit crunch is that you've suddenly got a change in the context and the values have changed. So the project remains the same. We've got big projects that were conceived CTRL, still the same project. And this actually goes back to John Friend's work. If you, if you remember his work, Friend and Hickling or Friend and Jefferson, um, Jeff, was that thing, where they talk about the risks and uncertainty of the context as opposed to the actual project or activity. And the, and, and the interaction one upon the other. I'm just wondering if uh, you have any sort of views on that. I think you're in the virtual circle. Right. <laughs> As opposed to virtuous. <laughs> the, the, uh, yeah, I mean, you cannot be... You know that Nigeria is hugely corrupt. Uh, and but I've yet to meet anybody who, who knows how to meaningful numbers to it. A while back I met a guy who was some international troubleshooter and he had come back from Nigeria to have investigated this brand new oil refinery um, that uh, was a joint Nigerian Italian Nigerian government Italian company of uh, which uh, it had burned down before it had produced it just about produced its first cow. 
uh, and it's a brand new installation, uh, immaculate concrete apron all around with fire hydrants, regular intervals all the way around it. And the problem was there was no pipe connecting the hydrants. Now that is corruption on the mind of boggling scale. People had to know what they were doing, had to believe they could get away with it. Um, and I don't know you know, what, what, the, what you need are, are, are experienced people who, you know, judge, experienced people with judgment. Well, well, the the context, like that. Okay, just to conclude then. I mean, the, what we have in England, however, is that the context has suddenly changed for us. It's not that we thought the banking financial framework of our work, of our country, of our projects was, was clean, or well ordered, was structured. And suddenly we're not dealing with Nigeria now, we're dealing with the UK. And all of a sudden we're finding that the values of the context has actually changed overnight. Now, the repercussions on the treatment of risks of big projects need to be reappraised. Do they not all or not? I think they I, I think you're, you're constantly reappraising that. Um, unless, unless you're lucky, um, unless you're a motor insurance actuary. Most other risks uh, are, are not as amenable as, as, as those. You know, you very few cases of large and stable actuarial pay cases, which can be projected complacently into next year. So it's events, my dear boy. John, thanks, thanks very much indeed. I don't do exactly. Thanks very much for coming and, and for us to be talk as usual.